Ski and uh, our bipartisan members to this important listening session. My understanding is we have 20 people in person to participate and speak and more than 60 online, so uh, buckle up. Um, it's gonna be a productive and robust conversation. Uh, the name of this listening session is Public Safety and Justice Resources in Native Communities. And I'm extremely pleased to see tribal leaders and advocates in the room today. And I thank you for attending. And for those logged into the WebEx or on the phone, we also appreciate your participation. This committee takes public si safety in Native communities very seriously. We recognize the diversity of needs from law enforcement funding to restoring tribal criminal jurisdiction and want to hear about your priorities to make your communities safer. For today's session, we, we set out five general areas for comment. First, law enforcement officer issues, including cross-deputization, recruitment, retention, and benefits parity. Second, corrections and detention center facilities funding and maintenance. Third, investigative tools such as equipment, data, and training resources. Fourth, tribal courts and justice systems. And finally, Public Law 280 issues. But these are just guidelines. Feel free to comment on any public safety matter affecting your communities or bring ideas for legislation, oversight, or other potential Indian Affairs Committee actions. As I've said before, and I mean this, this is your committee. This is your committee. We do the work, but you lead us. Thank you again for participating. Um, we are in the middle of votes, and so excuse the clunkiness of it all, but I am going to leave you to the staff, and then I think Vice Chair Murkowski will be coming to, offering, uh, to offer a few uh, of her remarks. But rest assured, you know, frankly, I don't normally come to listening sessions, but the caliber and the depth and breadth of knowledge represented in the room and on the WebEx caused me to want to say hello in person and to indicate to our bipartisan staff that this is supposed to guide what we do next legislatively and in terms of oversight and in terms of appropriation. So I'm um, looking forward to hearing the results and turning that into action. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone for your patience. Uh, Senator Murkowski is on her way. She's coming to the, from the floor. We expect her momentarily. We'll give her an opportunity to make some opening remarks and then we'll get started. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I understand that you have heard already from Chairman Schatz. I want to thank, want to thank all those who have been engaged in pulling together this listening session on public safety in our Native communities. I want to thank all those that are here and those that are going to be providing their comments um, and, and testimony to be included as part of the record. I think it's really important as we think about the next steps uh, to support tribal justice and law enforcement that we really take into account many of the, of the obstacles and sometimes the very unique obstacles that face tribes in different regions. I know that many um, who we're gonna be hearing from from the Alaska perspective are people that we have worked with over the years. They have been advocates for a long, long time when it comes to, to safety and, and justice. Um, but for those that I'm not as familiar with, just thank you. Thank you for your voice. Thank you for what you are contributing to not only the discussion, but then what follows on from that discussion, the policies that we will put in place. Uh, we need to have uh, your voice. We need to have 
um, oftentimes just vulnerable hearts in order to create the level of engagement that uh, I think uh, moves us forward. I think as, as I come from a state where we talk about what self-determination looks like and we think we, we know, we get it, we understand it in Alaska, but I respect that self-determination um, means that what works in the lower 48 might not work in, in places like Alaska. What works in interior Alaska might not work in, in villages along the Yukon Kuskokwim Delta. So respecting those, those unique perspectives, I think, is, is part of what we're calling for. Um, we, all, we all come as advocates. Uh, we've all been engaged in, in different ways of, of, of trying to help on these issues that are so hard. I've been trying to prioritize funding for our uh, PL uh, 280 states, uh, funding for our tribal courts, uh, what more we can do when it comes to the crisis of murdered missing indigenous women. We were successful in, in advancing uh, Savannah's Act, uh, the Not Invisible Act. We've made good progress, I think, with, uh, with legislation. I've had two opportunities now to host our United States Attorney General, one with the Trump administration, one with the Biden administration, to come to Alaska to see firsthand some of the challenges on the ground. I think it's made a noticeable, a perceptible difference. Last year, I think many of us were, were very focused in where we are with, uh, with, with VAWA 22, the reauthorization, and now the implementation. As part of that, I was able to author, along with the extraordinary help of so many, including my great staff, but the Alaska Tribal Public Safety Empowerment Act. We're now working on implementation on that. I'd like to get good in, input, the feedback from so many about how they're able to build tribal justice capacity and those that uh, can, uh, can focus on the technical assistance side of, of how we provide for that implementation. We, we've got so much to do, and I, I think here in this committee, we've been able to shine a light on some of these areas that have been particularly troubling. Most recently, uh, we had a hearing on, a, actually it was a series of hearings on, on fentanyl in our native communities, the importance of law enforcement coordination across our federal, our state, and our tribal governments. It was particularly painful uh, to be able to report some of what we're seeing in Alaska where some of our smallest native villages are being targeted by our uh, drug dealers, by the, trafficking, by the traffickers, because they can make up to 10 times as much selling these lethal drugs into these small villages. So it's no accident that they get out to the most remote of communities, the smallest of communities, because they know that they can command more for the poison that they sell. And they're killing, they're killing native people, they're killing people throughout rural America, they're killing people within and part of Indian country, and it is devastating. So there's, there's so much that needs to be shared. I'm glad that we're able to, to devote more than just the time that we have when we have a regular hearing where you have maybe four or five witnesses, they're able to share three to five minutes, and then we conclude the hearing because we have multiple uh, votes. We are in the middle of multiple votes right now. But this, this, uh, this roundtable, this listening session, is really here to gain valuable input so that we can help build on these policies. So thank you to those who are providing testimony, and thank you to the respective staffs for the good work that I know uh, we're all going to be doing together as we try to address the issues of public safety in, uh, in, in Indian country and in our Alaska Native communities. So thank you for that. And I now ask you to do the work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair Murkowski. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome again. My name is Jennifer. Uh, to Chairman Schatz on the Senate Committee on Indian Affairs. I'm joined by my counterpart, Amber Ebarb, who serves as a staff director to Vice Chair Murkowski. We both have our staffs present today who will introduce themselves shortly, but first, a few housekeeping notes. 
This listening session is being broadcast live via the committee's website and transcribed by a court reporter for the record. All comments, including those posted in the chat function of WebEx, will be recorded and transcribed for the record. Second, because we've had an overwhelming response to this listening session, and we want to hear from as many people as possible, we ask that you please limit your comments to three minutes. For in-person participants, please check in with Claudio. He's raising his hand in the back, and he'll bring the microphone to you. We will do our best to recognize tribal leaders first for their comments. We have a three-minute countdown clock located on my left and to your right for your ready reference. For online participants, you are automatically placed on mute. Please use the raise hand feature in your meeting window if you'd like to be called on. Once you are called on to speak, please unmute your line, start your video, and state your name, tribe, or tribal organization before providing comments. You will see a small countdown clock on your screen to help guide you, and our staff will notify you when your time has concluded. For those of you joining by phone, please text 202-731-1574 with your name and organization. That's 202-731-1574 so that we can make sure to call on you. Staff will inform you when your time to speak begins and notify you when your time has concluded. We understand this is an important topic and that speaking time is short. So if you'd like to submit additional written comments, which we also encourage, you can send them to testimony at indian.senate.gov. That's testimony at indian.senate.gov. This email address is in the chat for your reference as well. We will be accepting written comments until April 12th. Lastly, I'd like to acknowledge that today's listening session is a bipartisan effort, and I'll turn to staff to introduce themselves. Hello, my name is Lena Aoki, and I serve as general counsel for the committee. Hi, my name is Alana Purdy Montesinos, and I serve as policy advisor for Chairman Schatz on the committee. Hello, my name is Caroline Ackerman, and I serve as legislative assistant for Chairman Schatz on the committee. Hello, my name is Amber Ebarb, and I serve as staff director for Vice Chairman Murkowski on the committee. Hello, my name is Lucy Murfitt, and I serve as the Chief Counsel for Vice Chairman Murkowski on the committee. Hello, my name is Jacqueline Basili, and I serve as Policy Advisor and Press Secretary for Vice Chairman Murkowski on the committee. Hello, my name is Anna Powers, and I serve as Professional Staff Member for Vice Chairman Murkowski on the committee. Thank you. As a final reminder, we will alternate between folks in the hearing room and callers for their comments. We will do our best to recognize tribal leaders first. Please state your name and organization before you begin and limit your comments to three minutes. We are grateful for your participation and look forward to your comments. With that, we'll begin the listening session with our first in-person participant. Please raise your hand if you'd like to speak and Claudia will meet you with the mic. President Frank Starr comes out. Would you please bring in your comments? Okay. Matakiapi, <clears throat> uh, my name is Frank Starr comes out, and I'm the current president of the Oglala Sioux Tribe. I'm also the chairman of the Great Plains Tribal Chairmen's Association in the state of South Dakota, which is over 16 tribes uh, current, currently. I'd like to start today by pointing out that the federal criminal jurisdiction in, in our state of South Dakota is very different than it is in PL 280 states. In short, under current, current law, if an on-reservation crime involves an Indian perpetrator or an Indian victim, the state of South Dakota has no criminal jurisdiction over that case, even if it wants to help out. Those, those, those are federal and tribal crimes, period. All the defense attorney has to do is file one motion in the state court to get everything from a murder to a rape to an assault with a gun to get, those case, get, the, get the case dismissed. 
The fact the state, county, or lo local non-Indian police are not even allowed in, in South Dakota or by, by South Dakota law to patrol for Indian-related crimes on a reservation. And that means that if the federal government fails to fund us to do that, those crimes go unaddressed. I am, I am, I am giving your staff a copy of the criminal jurisdiction chart to put together by the US DOJ, which lays it all out. The FBI and the BIA Drug and Missing and Murder in a Persons Task Force are over 90 minutes away, and not, none of them are funded or even authorized to, to be responders to a federal crime. Yes, they, are, they all help, help out when they can, and we have a good relationship with all of them. They simply are over an hour and a half away, and that is not helpful when someone on our reservation is firing a loaded gun. As far as the DEA, DEA and federal alcohol, tobacco, and firearm, firearms, the only time I have seen, seen them is at federal meetings. I can't see the... <laughs> Uh, is when the only times I have seen them is at a federal meeting when they come to Pine Ridge and pick someone up for a warrant. While Oglala is, is very supportive of the tribes in PL280 states and Alaska, my only point is that we in South Dakota don't even have the luxury of lobbying the state for more help, even if we wanted to. Thank you for those comments. Really appreciate that. Chief Algin Young, would you please proceed with your comments? Would you raise your hand so Claudio can find you? Thank you. I can go. Apologies. Uh, Eugene DeCora, would you unmute and proceed? Are you on the WebEx with us? Yes, thank you. Good afternoon, committee members and staff. My name is Eugene DeCore, and I have the honor of serving as councilman for the Winnebago Tribe of Nebraska. My comments today will focus on inadequate law enforcement services being provided on the Winnebago Reservation by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. The BIA law enforcement staffing shortages and the overall insufficient level of police services are longstanding issues on the Winnebago Reservation. In the last year, there have been multiple times when the BIA Police Department in Winnebago has severely short staffed for various reasons, such as positions being left unfulfilled for extended periods of time, officers detailed to other reservations, and officers on administrative or other leave. As an example, in September 2023, BIA District 1 detailed the current BIA Chief of Police to another jurisdiction for 120 days leaving the Winnebago Reservation vulnerable. There was no notice to the Winnebago Tribal Council regarding this decision, and there was no communication from the Michigan One about the rationale. The action resulted in one of the existing officers being appointed as the acting chief of police and no action to backfill the position. The situation was on the heels of the tribe having to request the acting BIA chief of police deputize the BIA's conservation officers due to dangerously low law enforcement coverage on the reservation. As a result of the BIA's failure to provide insufficient large, to provide sufficient law enforcement staffing, the Winnebago Police Department has become overly reliant on tribal police officers and tribal conservation officers. These officers, as well as law enforcement support staff, are paid entirely from tribal resources. Despite the tribe funding most Winnebago law enforcement personnel, the day-to-day -day supervision and management in law enforcement staff is delegated to the local BIA chief of police and the BIA special agent in charge located in Aberdeen. The BIA Office of Justice Services has also failed to assure tribal leadership that the tribal police officers have received special law enforcement commissions that would authorize them to fully ex exercise certain powers and authorities and protect them from personal liability while acting within the scope of their duties. There's a lack of adult and juvenile facilities in Winnebago that is further contributing to our serious public safety concerns. The closest adult detention facility is located at the Omaha Tribe, which is 11 miles away, and Thurston County, which is 20 miles away. However, the BIA does not have an active contract with those facilities or those facilities do not have availability. 
As a result, detainees are being sent to the closest BI facility with availability, the closest one being the BI Corrective Jenkins Sioux Agency in Wagner, South Dakota, which is 122 miles away, which takes two hours of travel one way. This also pertains to our juvenile facility. They are forced, we are forced to resort to measures that because the closest BI juvenile facility is 450 miles away in Standing Rock, North Dakota, which is seven hour drive from Winnebago. We need the BIA to put a contract in place that provides secure local detention for juveniles. We need a clear policy to be communicated to the Winnebago Tribal Court and its employees. The Winnebago Tribal Council is doing all we can to avoid a community where criminals feel emboldened. The reservation residents feel vulnerable. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Chief Algin Young, would you please proceed with your comments? Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Elgin Young. I am an enrolled member of the Oglala Sioux Tribe and currently the Chief of Police. I have over 23 years of professional law enforcement experience in Indian Country, both federal and tribal. As the Chief of Police, I oversee the law enforcement on the Pine Ridge Res Reservation, the third largest reservation in the nation. As of February 14, 2023, the tribe has an enrolled membership of 51,460 and a service population of over 43,000. Spanned throughout 52 communities on the reservation. As a result of the influx of guns, illegal drugs, including fentanyl, methamphetamine, and heroin, and violent crime that can only be described as shocking and extremely dangerous. I testified to the, uh, on the public safety crisis on Pine Ridge before the House of Appropriations Subcommittee on March 9th, 2023. Since that time, nothing has changed. Instead, it's only gotten worse. Um, on Pine Ridge, we have had 11 homicides since I testified. At any one time, our tribe only has six to eight police officers on duty in a span of over three million acres, which, uh, which impacts our recruitment. Um, and many of you have heard my testimony on the BIA raises, which the tribe can't compete with. Uh, our dispatch numbers, our calls into our dispatch have risen from 131,000 in 2022 to 166,000 in 2023. The Oglala Sioux Tribe had over 1,100 assault calls in 2023, along with 1,200, over 1,200 domestic violence calls and over 500 calls invo involving guns. Our people don't feel safe in the communities, and our visitors do not either. Most recently this year, um, reservation schools had contacted us to see if it was even safe to come on the reservation and debated whether or not to hold sport activities. This is not only heartbreaking, it's unacceptable. In 2023, our staff responded to over 500 calls at the schools on the Pine Ridge Reservation. We need an oversight hearing on law enforcement issues in Indian Country and request that it be, and that request that we be held, to t we be called to testify at such hearing. Thank you to the committee mem members, Senator Rounds and Senator Thune, who sit on this committee for holding this listening session. Thank you. Thank you for that. Sherilyn Yazzie, would you please unmute and proceed with your comments? If you're not with us, we'll move on. Mr. Tony Hilaire, would you please unmute and proceed if you're on the WebEx? Yeah, thank you. Uh, Siam uh, my dear friends and relatives, my name is Tony Hilaire, my name is Satsumton, and I come from Lummi, uh, chairman of the Lummi Nation. I'd like to thank you all for being here today. Uh, thank you to this committee for their ongoing work in uh, leading this effort and hearing from tribal nations the, the various concerns in, in Indian country as it relates to public safety and jurisdiction. Uh, I want to start off by just asking you all, how many funerals have you been to this year? And for us at Lummi Nation, at times it feels like we're going to a funeral every single day. And for us, uh, we don't want sympathy, we want empathy. Uh, the losses that we have are not just a stat or a number of overdoses that we've had. It's, it's our children, our sons and our daughters, our mothers, our fathers, 
our brothers and our sisters. And these non-Indian predatory drug dealers are murdering our people. And we believe that uh, us as uh, signatories of the Point Elliott Treaty of 1855 carry a shared responsibility. Uh, and also the federal government carries the shared responsibility to uphold the promises that were made. Uh, it is well documented that in, in various uh, congressional reports that criminal jurisdiction in Indian country is an indefensible mix up of complex, conflicting and illogical commands of one nation over another. As tribal nations, especially at Lummi Nation, we understand best how to ensure the safety of, of our community, uh, but we require both funding and authority to do so. And given the complexities of addressing criminal jurisdiction, uh, there's there's a lot to cover here as, as well as public safety, uh, but we, uh, and in no particular order, have the following recommendations as to how to Congress can help improve public safety in Indian country. And I'll start off by one, establish the Tribal Justice Advisory Committee within the Department of Justice and Department of Interior. Two, create a new Associate Attorney General position for American Indians and Alaska Natives within the Department of Justice. Three, pass the a parity for Tribal Law Enforcement Act, uh, Senate Bill 2695, which would help address law enforcement recruitment, retention, and benefits pay. Four, similar to VAWA jurisdiction, expand special tribal criminal jurisdiction over non-Indian drug dealers who are preying on our people. This jurisdiction, along with the option of the Attorney General to permit incarceration of any convicted offender by the Bureau of Prisons, will provide an adequate mechanism to begin addressing the fentanyl crisis we face. Five, work to enhance cross-jurisdictional cooperation through our more robust cross-deputization agreements. Six, work to improve access to behavioral health and drug treatment services, including prevention. For example, the Lummi Nation received funding for the Indian Health Service Community Opioid Intervention Pilot Project. Through that project, we were able to reach 500 individuals in our community. What we are in need of now is funding to facilitate the construction of our detox facility. And seven, uh, develop more robust guidelines for law enforcement activities and enhance coordination among federal, tribal, and state authorities. And eight, provide additional funding and support to bolster the capacity of tribal police forces and tribal courts, including support for recruitment, training, and infrastructure development. Uh, in conclusion, we must work together to ensure a safer and more just community for everyone. Uh, thank you again for allowing us to speak, for providing this platform and continuing your, your leadership in trying to change the world for the better. Thank you. Thank you. Director Charles Cooney, would you please proceed with your comments? Good afternoon. My name is Charles Cooney. I'm an enrolled member of the Ogallala Sioux Tribe. I was formerly the superintendent at Little Wind School, which is the largest tribal grant school on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, serving seven out of the nine districts on our reservation. And I'm here today to support the Ogallala Sioux Tribe. Our president, Star, comes out and our chief of police in, the, in their plight for, for additional resources. I just want to give you some, some facts. According to the Center for Disease Control and Guns, the leading cause of death among children and teens is guns. According to NCAI, Native Americans make up 2% of the population, but Native American youth make up 40% of the human traffic survivors. As you know, the BIE is currently $2 billion underfunded. Um, some other themes that we've pushed in 2018, Cecilia Fire Thunder, the school board president of Little Wound School testified to this committee, the dire need for school resource offices. Then Director, Director Dearman testified that the BIE never calculated the cost to support school resource officers at BIE funded schools. This was in May 18th of 2018. Six years later, BIE finally revealed this Tuesday at the Intertribal Budget Council that the cost for SROs will be $93 million. Um, this, this, this is funds that the BIE doesn't have. Uh, today, tribal grant schools fund SROs uh, through Sioux School Security, and, and that's taken from our, our ISEP funding. I think the one thing that I really want to convey 
to the committee here today is I have firsthand experience of, of the lack of law enforcement resources. So when we have an incident at the school and the response time isn't right, it puts people in jeopardy. Um, if we don't have people in our school in 15 minutes, it puts the whole situation, uh, people could, could be hurt. And so anything that we can do to increase our law enforcement, to increase our, our federal funding, is gonna support our community. I don't think you guys understand 30 officers for the size of our reservation is not adequate. When you need a cop, it has to be there on time. Anything that this committee can do to see that and, and, and allocate resources, not just for the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, but all of Indian country will go a long way. Thank you for your time. I wanna thank Senator Rounds, Thune, and Heidekamp for giving us the opportunity to speak today. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Lawrence Harlan, if you're on the WebEx, would you please unmute and proceed with your comments? Okay, I don't believe he's with us. Director Troy Landerman, would you please stand up and proceed with your comments? My name is Troy Lunderman. I'm the Human Resource Director and Director of Development for the St. Francis Indian School, a tribal grand school located on the Rosebud Indian Reservation. I'm also a proud member of the Rosebud Sioux Tribe and have spent my entire profession working with tribal communities in aspects of youth affairs, uh, economic development, gaming, and now tribal schools. I'm also here to discuss the need for school resource officers at BIE-funded tribal-controlled schools. Having a school resource officer on campus ensures the safety and well-being of our students, parents, and guardians while on campus of the school. You must remember that tribal communities are significantly underfunded and often poor. Our schools are safety nets for our communities and we are often the only source of food for these students as we are the safe space for our students as well. For example, in the 2022-23 school year, when we did not have an SRO, we had 406 student incidents, which included a wide range of violating including alcohol, tobacco, and weapons possessions to violence, disorderly conduct, and harassment. In 2023-24 school year, as of March 15th, with an SRO, we have had 169 student incidents, which although encompass similar incidents, we have seen a dramatic decrease in overall incidents. It has not even been a year since we have had an SRO at our school, but it has had a significant impact on our school, and there seems to be a prevention and minimization of student injuries. Student contact with our school resource officer helps build that relationship among staff and school community too. There would be a benefit to have more SROs on school campuses with the size of school acreage plus the number of buildings that we have. As grateful as we are to have one at the high school, there are still many needs also at the elementary and middle school as we are spread out on our campus. Bottom line is by having a school resource officer here at SFIS is definitely leading to fewer school incidences. Um, I think, um, one thing the, the SRO does I, I really enjoy is teachable moments, being in the school. So when there's an incident, she talks to the students on what this possibly could lead to, what kind of trouble they can get into, and why they shouldn't do it anymore. Um, the younger kids, they tell us that they feel safer with the police on there. Um, of course, with meth and, and all the other drugs and trafficking and things like that in the communities, um, the little kids know they, they feel safe and, and they can really appreciate it. The issue we had is that we've been at this for about two years, and it took a year for the MOU to get signed because our chief, tribal police chief was hesitant because he'd be losing a police officer, and we're already underfunded and understaffed. Um, with it, though, is there, the agreement is that they are still considered a tribal police officer, and when need be, they will have to leave the school to go on calls. A lot of these incidences that we're having this year happen when they know the SRO is off campus. I mean, kids are smart. Um, so having one that could be funded and fully at the school all the time, I think would benefit us greatly as well. So um, in closing, I want to thank the committee and the members, Senator Round, Senator Thune, who sits on the committee, uh, for holding this listening session. Thank you. Thank you. Again, we're going to alternate between the WebEx participants and those in person. Rosa Ravi Jacobs, if you're on the WebEx, please unmute and proceed with your comments.
I don't believe she's with us. Director Charles Addington, would you please stand and proceed with your comments? Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Charles Addington. I'm an enrolled member of the Cherokee Nation in Oklahoma, and I'm the executive director for the Quapaw Nation Department of Public Safety. Uh, it's great to be here today. To, I, I've spent 20 plus years on the federal side of the house working for the Bureau of Indian Affairs Office of Justice Services. So I've seen the federal side. Now I'm here to uh, very pleased to talk to you about being on the tribal side of the house and seeing the other side of what's going on in Indian country. Uh, one of the things uh, that's real devastating out there is just, you know, the, the funds are not making it down to the tribes. And I, that's the one uh, thing that I think that I can bring to you today to, to give you an advice is make sure the funds are getting down to the tribal programs. Uh, as you see, the increase in funding that comes out from Congress, uh, a lot of those money, funds are not making it all the way down uh, to the tribal programs where the boots on the ground are actually at and they're staying at a higher level either in the federal government or uh, being put in national programs uh, to where it's not benefiting the tribes. And I think all the tribal leaders here and all the chiefs of police that's out there uh, working boots on the ground can tell you they're not seeing the resources make it down to them. And that's the only way we're going to make a difference is to make sure it actually gets down to where it does the best need. It's just like the, the missing and murdered unit. I was a part of, of developing that whole uh, cold case offices in the missing murder initiative. Uh, and we've not seen any money at the tribal side of the house. There's $14 million uh, being given over to uh, the BIA and there's none of it making it down to the tribal programs. It's all being kept at that level. Uh, in order to make a difference, you've got to make sure you're being partners with these tribal law enforcement uh, programs, fund those tribal law enforcement officers that can be a part of that because they're out there, they're the first responders, and those are the things that's going to make the biggest difference. Same thing with the Division of Drug Enforcement. BIA's got about $12 million that they get for Division of Drug Enforcement, and my local dr BIA drug agent is being detailed off to... Uh, Arizona to do general crimes. He's not even doing drug enforcement. So my drug agent, who I've graciously uh, put a resource on the task force with them, uh, is not able to do things because his counterpart with the BIA is being detailed off. So those things are just continue obstacles that keeps us from doing uh, the work that we need to do in Indian country. Uh, so, you know, those are some of the things that I'm seeing uh, fr from at least the tribal side of the uh, the House, and also as we're not seeing uh, our federal partners even come out. I've been uh, a chief of police, uh, chief marshal, and executive director here at the Quapaw Nation for two years, and I've got some of the best uh, law enforcement officers, the best court folks uh, out there, and they're doing a fabulous job, and that's the same way it is all through Indian country. We've got fabulous talent in, in BIOJS and all these tribal programs, but without the support and the coordination between all these different agencies, it is very difficult. We can't do it by ourselves. The feds can't do it by themselves. The tribes can't do it by ourselves. Uh, so if we can get the money down to the tribes, I think that's where you're going to see the absolute biggest uh, impact to reduce crime and to make uh, our community safer. So thank you. Thank you. We'd like to recognize Senator Tester. Thanks for joining us today, Senator. Appreciate the opportunity to, to, to just make a very short presentation. Welcome Councilman Kirk, uh, Fort Peck, and President Stipharm from Fort Belknap. So I can speak to this issue from a large land-based tribes which we have in Montana. Um, and it comes down and by the way, um, and I'm telling you what you guys live. I mean, we got cartels in Indian country. We got a lot of bad shit going on. And what it amounts to, a lot of these tribes are bigger in some states, the land mass is. And we just got a handful, and it's that handful of police officers. And um, whether it's, it's a tribe doing their own work because they've contracted out, or whether it's the BIA officers whether it's FBI, we need more of all of the above. Um, and I think that and only that solves the problem. Um, but I'm sure through the conversation here, there may be some other things that we can do off this committee under the chairmanship of Chairman Schatz to move the ball forward. Uh, I will tell you the same thing I tell the veterans in this country, and that is we should be taking our cues from you. 
We should be listening to what you have to say, what your challenges, what your problems are, what your solutions are for those problems. If we did more of that, we would find out that Indian country would be far safer. And I think if we're gonna have economic development, if we're gonna lift people out of poverty, if we're gonna have good schools, good houses, all the above, it all starts with safe communities. So thank you all for being here. Thanks for what you do. Special hello to the Montana folks. And, um, and we look forward to seeing what comes out of this because hopefully there's some good things that we on this committee can take and run with. Uh, we've got good leadership with Murkowski and Schatz. Uh, Murkowski, uh, the ranking member, Schatz being the chairman. So thank you all very much. Have a great uh, roundtable conversation. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thomas Tortez, if you're on the WebEx, would you please unmute? And proceed with your comments. Sorry, right, can you hear me? Yes, please proceed. All right, thank you uh, for hearing me. Uh, my name is Thomas Tortoise. I'm the Torres Martinez uh, Desert Kawia Tribal Chairman, and uh, honored to be speaking here before you today. And I want to uh, go back to a testimony before the uh, Safer Indian Communities uh, Legislative Hearing on Public Safety Bill back in 2017 from the Attorney General back then. Uh, the Attorney General uh, also, you know, spoke about the beginning of these bills, the three bills that were important to him from Oklahoma. And so when he was talking about the tribal Law and Order Act of 2010, which was passed by the president back then, there were three bills that were important in the beginning of this safety committee back then. So he also talked about uh, being a liaison, and I think that's important, an important step that we need to advocate and implement and just create a better liaison support for the tribes. This position is crucial for all tribes as we had tribal liaisons with the sheriff, but it is uh, intermittent. It's not a consistent basis and it continues to revolve. So if we had a consistent tribal liaison to work with the tribes, I think that would uh, suffice with creating a better safety public act with, with the tribes. And I know what the uh, Attorney General spoke back then about the Survive Act. As I mentioned, he talked about the Tribal Law and Order Act and he talked about the Savannah's Act. And when he noted that there still needs to be recurring efforts to improve data collection and information sharing, which I think is a barrier between our tribe and the local communities here. Uh, so we need to improve the collection and access whenever we need to. Uh, this would increase our public safety within the area. Uh, recently, We've had a discovery of remains within the outside ancestral area of our tribe. And instead of treating it like a cold case, it's been treated as a repatriation. And the powers that be tried to return these remains to us so that we could repatriate them and then everything be swept under the rug. So we stood our ground and referred this back to the coroner and the district attorney. And they're now looking at this, but we feel that it's still gonna be you know, uh, overlooked since it's been determined. It's been determined to be Native American uh, remains. They're trying to shove it under the rug as a repatriation. And we still are adamant about making this a cold case since it was uh, discovered in 1981. It's not ancient. It's not, our, our, you know, ancestral. It's a cold case, just like any other person. I believe it, if it was determined to be not Native American remains, I believe it would have been open as a cold case. So again, uh, we support all these bills. We support the safety committee for hearing all of these, uh, but we still would like you know, the support uh, that we can get as a tribe to just get equality in all of the cases, especially this one now uh, that we're looking at with this case. Uh, again, uh, my name is Thomas Tortoise, the tribal council chairman Torres Martinez, and thank you for allowing the, me to speak on the Safer, Safer Indian Community Committee. Thank you. Manuel Hart, 
Would you please stand and proceed with your comments? Good afternoon to everyone here. My name is Manuel Hart. I'm the chairman for the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe. I'd like to thank the Senator or Chairman Schatz and Vice Chair Kowski for listening in to our issues that we have. I'd like to address the issues of hiring for law enforcement officers for Ute Mountain Ute Tribe. First of all, Ute Mountain Ute Tribe has a land base of 600,000 acres going into three states. We have two communities, uh, bigger communities in Colorado or smaller ones in Utah, Southeast Utah. So we have 2,100 enroll members. We used to have 10 officers. We lost three positions due to the cost of living increase. So we'd like to request to get these three officer positions back. I know it's based on budget, but right now, the hiring process is another concern that we have. Hiring law enforcement officers takes about one year for a background check. And that's a big concern if we have officers applying for these positions, but not able to be hired because of the background checks that we have and the process that they go through. I've had these positions open right now. I have two. Currently, I have three officers working 12-hour shifts and one chief of police. This is our first chief of police we've had in a long time. They haven't stayed very long, and they've left. So we, this is our first chief of police we've had in over 15 years. They've left in one year or less. So what we'd like to request is also um, the... We have a MOU with the state of Utah in San Juan County on cross-deputization. We cannot do that cross-deputization because the state has litigation with another tribe in the state. So that falls under the state and the county. So we can't hire or have a cross-deputization with San Juan County and, and Utah and San Juan County in New Mexico. So we do have about 104,000 acres in New Mexico. We do have a regional facility for both adults and youth. The maintenance for that facility is so huge that we're not able to keep up on the maintenance on that. And that's been there for a while, so we'll run into maintenance issues. Our dispatch, when we dispatch somebody out there on a certain frequency, and that frequency is not compatible with our EMS. So we have to develop something that's more like a 911 process. We have shootings that are going on almost every night, but our court cases, our dockets are 90 to 95% alcohol related. And this is for a dry reservation. And we recently had a fire of a building and the BIA does not even have an investigator for arson fires. So these are the concerns that come from the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe. We are looking for more law enforcement officers. We can't enforce the law if we don't have any law enforcement officers. So this is our testimony today. We'd like to thank everybody, staff, senators, the Senate Indian Affairs. Thank you, Chairman Manuel Hart, Ute Mountain Ute Tribe. Thank you, sir. Joseph Rupnik, if you're online, would you please unmute and proceed with your comments? Hello, my name is Joseph Rupnik. I'm the chairman for Prairie Band Potawatomi Nation. Thank you for hosting this important listening session. In the 1940s, during the termination era, the United States chose a policy that fundamentally altered the relationship between tribal nations and the federal government. This era was marked by the passage of the Kansas Act of 1940, the first federal legislation to extend state criminal jurisdiction over Indian lands. This Kansas Act was a clear manifestation of Indian termination policy that aimed to assimilate Indians and terminate their sovereignty and treaty rights. The ramifications of the Kansas Act are still in effect today. As you know, in 1953, Congress established the procedure for states to assume criminal and civil jurisdiction when it enacted Public Law 280. However, in 1968, in response to the failure of the termination era policy, Congress passed legislation that required tribal consent for state jurisdiction and permitted retrocession of jurisdiction back to the tribes. Despite this corrective measure for PL 280 states, the Kansas Act of 1940 remains a standalone piece of legislation granting state jurisdiction without tribal consent. 
It's a relic of an era that undermines our sovereignty and the right to self-govern. Therefore, I urge this committee to support the Kansas Indian Country Law Enforcement Improvement Act of 2023, known as H.R. 1552, which will repeal the Kansas Act in 1940. This act impacts not only Prairie Band Potawatomi Nation, but three other federally recognized tribes in Kansas. We are committed to ensuring the safety and well-being of our people and communities. And we have our own police forces. And through H.R. 1552, we ex seek not to exclude state involvement, but to foster a partnership that respectfully acknowledges our inherent rights and governance capabilities. Kansas and the four tribes have already made strides in, in this direction by deputizing our tribal officers to enforce state laws on our lands. Aside from the Kansas Act repeal, a critical area of concern remains regarding jurid jurisdictional gaps created by the Supreme Court's 1978 decision of Oliphant versus Suquamish Indian tribe. This decision has significantly undermine our ability to police our territories and protect our people. To address this, we need legislation that affirms our inherent sovereignty to exercise criminal jurisdiction over non-Indians who commit crimes within our reservations. While I understand a full Oliphant fix may be difficult to achieve at this time, I urge this committee to focus on expanding VAWA's special tribal criminal jurisdiction to other areas such as drug-related crimes which has become a significant issue on our reservation. Non-Indian drug dealers know that tribal governments do not have criminal jurisdiction to pr prosecute them and put them in jail. We request immediate action by Congress to enact legislation to expand recognition of tribal jurisdiction to prosecute non-Indian drug offenders. We also ask these offend, uh, ask that these offenders upon conviction be eligible for punishment under federal prison. Aside from this jurisdictional recommend, recommendations to the committee, we also recommend the establishment of a tribal justice advisory committee within the Department of Justice and Interior and the creation of an associate attorney general position for the American Indians and Alaska Natives within the Department of Justice. These actions along with additional funding and support for tribal police forces and tribal courts are critical for enhancing our capacity to maintain public safety and justice within Indian country. Thank you for those comments, sir. Unfortunately, out of fairness to everyone else, we have to move along. Mr. Janadev Chaudhuri, would you please stand and proceed with your comments? Madhu, excuse uh, my name is John Dev Chowdhury, John Dev Chowdhury, uh, Thank you to the entire committee, all the members and the staff for having this listening session. Just want to make a few quick points. There is absolutely a crisis in Indian country, a law enforcement crisis. The solution, however, is and always has been empowering tribal nations to protect everyone within their borders. While there are many solutions that have been presented and, and solutions that address budgeting or maybe fentanyl uh, issues or drug enforcement issues, there's a commonality with all the problems. And the co commonality is that tribal nations have been handcuffed in their ability to protect their own. Uh, the previous speaker mentioned the 1978 Oliphant decision. We know that was the original sin that strip tribes of their inherent authority to prosecute people in, in, within their homelands unless they happen to be Indian. Well, for all the reasons we, we've discussed, non-Indians know that creates a bastion, a, a safe place for criminal activity to occur. When we talk about solutions, it's impossible to strip things down with a series of one-offs. A one-off solution, say, in the, in, in the scope of fentanyl or drug enforcement, will always, by the nature of it being a specific solution, will fail to capture collateral crimes that come along with things like drug enforcement. Collateral crimes such as m money laundering, property crimes, other violent crimes that come along with drug enforcement that may, on the surface, not appear to be drug-related. 
addressing problems with a one-off approach is like trying to bail water out of a sinking canoe when you know the solution is to fix the leak. And the leak is restore, the, the problem with tribes not being able to enforce their own laws within their own community. At my nation, the Muscogee Nation, the nation to which I serve as ambassador, uh, we're the fourth largest nation in Indian country. We have over three million acres within our, our borders. We have parts of 11 counties, eight separate counties. Each one of those counties and each one of those cities within their, those counties all have their own policies. You talk about a checkerboard approach to law enforcement. You talk about uh, a scattershot approach to law enforcement. There's no way for our nation, like so many other nations, to have sensible policy addressing crime within our borders. The solution is empowering the local governments on the ground. That's always been the solution. So, uh, sorry, two quick, you know. Um, thank you, thank you. We really appreciate your comments. Unfortunately, we got to move on. I apologize. Alex Clickhorn, would you please unmute and proceed? My and good afternoon. Um, I want to thank the committee for holding these listening sessions on such an important topic. My name is Alex Cleghorn. I serve as the Chief Operating Officer of the Alaska Native Justice Center. I am also the elected president of the Woody Island Tribal Council, which is the governing body of the Dogdingnock Native Village on Kodiak, Alaska. I've been an attorney for 21 years, and most of my work has focused on representing tribes and tribal organizations. Alaska tribes have been governing ourselves and protecting our citizens since time immemorial. However, longstanding confusion about the status of Alaska tribes and our jurisdiction, a lack of consistent funding, and Alaska's unique geography have all helped create the well-known public safety crisis that we face. Yes, ANCSA terminated reservations, but it did not terminate tribes. Public Law 280 applied to Alaska at state, statehood. However, Public Law 280 did not diminish tribal jurisdiction. Federal law is now clear. Alaska tribes have concurrent jurisdiction to address crimes and public safety concerns within our villages. However, there is a lasting impact of Public Law 280, a lasting legacy. It was an unfunded mandate to the states, and this has been particularly acute in Alaska, where the state has not been able to establish or maintain an effective public safety footprint off the road system and in rural Alaska. Over a third of our villages have no permanent law enforcement presence and an emergency response can be days away. This is a well-known public safety crisis and it has persisted for years and it is absolutely unacceptable. What little BIA public safety and justice funding is appropriated is prioritized for non-PL280 states and Alaska tribes do not receive any PSJ based funding. There is just too little to go around for all of us. Also, Alaska tribes are not able to self-determine public safety and justice PSFAs because the federal government agencies providing those services don't allow for ISDIA contracting or compacting. TOLOA directed the BIA to provide an annual report to Congress documenting the unmet public safety and justice needs in Indian country and Alaska and the BIA has been submitting those reports for many years. So the needs are well documented. Please don't get me wrong, any funding is well received, but most of the funding is through special one-time funding or DOJ grants of three years. We recognize and are grateful for the recent law changes in the Alaska Tribal Public Safety Section of VAWA 22 and the Alaska Native Justice Center with our partners at AVCP AKWNRC, TCC, Rural Cap, and UAF is supporting the Department of Justice, OVW, and standing up an Alaska Intertribal Working Group. 
The stay of the date for the first Alaska Itwig has been set. It's May 9th and 10th in Fairbanks, Alaska. Our goal is to provide that training. Thank you for those comments. Unfortunately, we have to move along out of fairness to everyone. Eugenia Charles Newton, would you please stand and proceed with your comments? Thank you. I was starting to wonder if women were going to be called to provide testimony here today. I want to start by saying that we stand with all the tribal leaders who have testified. We need more funds, just straight out. There are 570 plus tribes. Please don't treat us all the same because we're all different. For Navajo, we are the largest tribe with the largest nation in Indian country, with over 400,000 tribal citizens, 27,000 square miles across three states, 214 law enforcement officers, three criminal investigators. I can tell you that from 2018 to August 2000 and 2023, we had 219,972 calls for services. We have 661 sex offenders currently living in our nation. From 2019 to 2022, there were 233 declined cases for federal prosecution, 75 of those being child sexual assault cases, 44 of those being for murder or attempted murder. You asked us to provide testimony here today. I'll tell you for recruitment and retention, Navajo cannot compete with surrounding jurisdictions when it comes to salary and bonuses offered by other jurisdictions. Because tribes are not afforded proper negotiation powers for all 638 contracts, our officers and our criminal investigators are not on the same pay levels as those at, on the federal level who are doing the same line of work. Navajo needs BIA to hear and to convey our needs. Number two, we recommend benefit parity for our 638 employees, namely law enforcement, criminal investigators, detention officers, and others who, have, who fall under 638 contract. Navajo recommends mandatory funding for 105L lease if budget line items for, for BIA facility replacement is not fully funded. If it is fully funded, tribes will have the opportunity to build facilities and get funding for operations and maintenance costs. Last I, last, I ask for proper communication from agencies, those agencies being the Department of Justice, Drug Enforcement Agency, Bureau of Indian Affairs under the Department of Interior, Federal Bureau of Investigations, Homeland Security, Indian Health Services, just to name a few. I can say that it is, it's hard to imagine that crime is happening in Indian country and people are being killed as a result of that. BIA is once again completely ignoring its federal trust responsibility by leaving us with an increase that won't even cover our inflation in mandatory third-party costs, no money for tribal officers to receive the same pay raises they have already given their own staff, $2 million for upgrade and enforce the professional standards in their own law enforcement handbook, $3.5 million to upgrade their own internal affairs division and staff, which by the way, they have refused our request to, con to properly contract, money to cover their own inflation and mandatory BIA items, and money to cover the pay raises they have already given their own employees. That is what this Indian country is facing. My name is Eugenia Charles Newton. I represent the 25th Navajo Nation Council. I'm, law and order, uh, I'm the chairwoman for Law and Order Committee. I also co-chair Public Safety and Justice at the Tribal Interior Budget Council. Ahihat, thank you. Thank you. Roberta Murphy, if you're on the WebEx, would you please unmute and proceed with your comments? Okay, Bryce Kirk, would you please stand and proceed with your comments? Uh, good afternoon, I appreciate the opportunity to present the comments today. I was able to testify before the committee regarding fentanyl crisis on the Fort Peck Indian Res Reservation and would like the testimony to be included in the record for the listening session. A as you heard here um, from everybody and as you'll continue to hear, it's like we're having a war when it comes to Indian country. Right now, like, like they shared, is bipartisan in here. You know, one thing that bipartisanly, whether you disagree or agree, we're at a war when it comes to reservations within the United States of America. Right now, there's a foreign aid package to send $40 billion overseas to a war that's happening. 
You heard of a war that's been going on for years in Indian country and we're left behind. One thing is, is that we got to start sending direct funding and let tribes say what's going to happen on our reservations, mental health, treatment centers, all those things to be able to protect our own people and police our, and, and police our reservations. When it comes to VAWA, the extended VAWA, to be able to prosecute non-Indians non that come on our reservation, to be able to prosecute them when they come and sell drugs on our reservation. One thing is, is that when it comes to BIA, they have lied continually when it comes to helping reservations. When it comes to that, I feel that having them as a middleman when it comes to reservations and tribes, I feel that is catastrophic to what we need to do and what we should be able to do on our own reservations. I thank you for the time. I thank you for everything that you guys do. I thank you that we have a voice when it comes to this. But please, when you go back to the, as staffers, when you go back to your people, think about that. A war, you've been hearing that when it comes to reservations. There's something happening right now with you guys letting us have our voice. As we think about sending $40 billion there, and you hear of us being $2 billion short when it comes to public safety and justice and BIA, look to that. Just think about what $2 billion would do right here in the United States. Think about the lives that it can change right here in the United States. Let's start looking inward instead of looking outward. Let our voices be heard. We're not invisible no more. We're here. We're going to continue to fight. We're going to continue to go forward. With the little peanuts that we get, we're still going to try to make a difference for our kids. We're still going to try to make a difference. We need your help as Congress and as staffers to be able to help us make a difference when it comes to our communities and our kids and our people that continue to die every single day. Thank you very much for your time and appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Vernon Vera, if you're online, would you please proceed with your comments? If Mr. Vera is not online, we'll move on to Ms. Lisa White Pipe. Would you please raise your hand so you can give your comments? Okay. Have a Good afternoon. My name is Lisa White Pipe. I am a council representative from the Rosebud Sioux Tribe. I also sit as co chair on the Tribal Interior Budget Committee and treasurer of the Coalition of Large Tribes. Um, Currently on the Rosebud Sioux Tribe, we have 25 officers, four investigators, and 10 dispatchers with a budget of 2.6 million. Our officers cover over five counties. And, um, and they had, last year in uh, 2023, we had calls for 24,000 uh, service calls, we, and which mirror that of Pennington County in South Dakota. Pennington County is in the Rapid City area, which is our largest county, and it's the mostly populated in South Dakota. The Coalition for Large Tribes and other tribal organizations have long proposed solutions to address these budget shortfalls. You can see on Coalition of Large Tribes Resolution 04-2022, I want to urge you all to implement Coalition of Large Tribes public safety proposal, which has been adopted by virtually every significant intertribal organization in the country. Tribal law enforcement is also cr critically underfunded. Unmet need as to public safety is right up in front in the Tribal Law and Order Report that was released by BIA OJS this month, which states overall Indian Country BIA public safety justice is funded at under 13% total need of additional 20, 26,000 personnel to serve Indian Country, adequately serve Indian Country, with the interest of reaching a benchmark of 2.8 officers per thousand members of the service population. As of 2021, we are 3, 000, 3 million billion short on public safety. 87% of Indian countries need to complete unmet and yet unmet need, and yet Attorney General Garland celebrated highlighting one of MMIP's prosecutor for the region when he visited the Crow tribe this past month. One week after the Tolor report came out, the president published his proposed FY 2025 budget, which includes just 651.2 million for public safety and justice programs, unmet need per the Tolor report is 3 billion, and they're starting at six, 651 million. What is the point of starting, not what Indian country will end up with out of the totally broken budget process? 
but at 20% of need. At the same month, the Department of Justice released yet another not visible report at 231 pages, how much did it cost to produce this report that tells our people we are dying and suffering because of the gross underfunding, our jurisdictional disempowerment of tribal nations. That money would be better spent on actually funding tribal law enforcement at full need at three billion. Congress must take action to fully fund public safety and justice in Indian country. That is it, thank you. Thank you. Sorrell Smokey, would you please unmute and proceed with your comments? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, please proceed. Oh. Uh, hello, my name is Sorrell Smokey, chairman of the Washoe Tribe of Nevada, California. And um, we're a little unique as far as being under 638 compact as well as um, uh, PL 280 uh, laws in our communities within California. <clears throat> um, talking about a lot of the unmet needs um, for recruitment and retention and benefits is, is huge because there's no incentive for uh, tribes to be able to recruit our own um, tribal members as part of our law enforcement. Um, because there's, there's no funding available. Um, I'll echo some of the comments that I've already made regarding the, um, we can't compete with local uh, law enforcement and the uh, benefits and pay that they can um, can offer. And we lose a lot of officers that we come have coming in uh, to our tribal police as a part of that. Um, jurisdictional boundaries are, are very upsetting uh, especially within the Washoe tribe, we've had uh, two recent deaths of drug overdoses that get handed over to the county and the tribe has no jurisdiction anymore because of PL-280. Now, nothing happens beyond that. Uh, we're looking over our own communities, but the, the fact that we have to uh, hand over jurisdiction, um, you know, nothing comes out of it. And the local jurisdiction within uh, our communities also, uh, they're, they're barely, they're struggling themselves. So uh, it becomes a huge problem. Um, overall, it's really that the tribes are not getting the proper resources to fit the needs of the tribe, which we're all, we're all different. The, um, the, again, no retirement system, um, facilities. Uh, I don't think it's still being understood is the issue that when having to transport uh, inmates to a, a BI facility is, is very costly uh, for the tribes and we pay, pay for that out of our own pockets. Working with local tribes is something that we do to protect ourselves and to help our membership, but at the same time we're doing it ourselves and that costs out of pocket for us in order to do so and we're not receiving funding back. Um, for doing that, but we're going to continue doing what needs to be done to protect our own communities um, But really want the government to uphold the trust responsibility, which is not happening. Thank you Thank you Donna Anthony, would you please raise your hand and proceed with your comments? My name is Donna Anthony. I'm the chief of police for the Chicklin Police Department. I'm born and raised in Alaska and I have 20 years of law enforcement experience. Chicklin Police Department was recently awarded the VAWA pilot program, the first in Alaska. The Chicklin Tribal Police Department provides the ability to keep tribal citizens safe with surrounding areas with other tribes. We have intertribal agreements and MOUs uh, provided to provide court services and tribal law enforcement. There is a new MOU and a special commission from the Department of Public Safety currently with our tribal legal review. Upon completion of this legal review, we will provide, Chick we'll provide Chicklin Police Department with the ability to work tribal, state, and federal prosecution. With the State of Alaska Special Commission, this will allow the officers to arrest a person who commits a crime against Alaska Native and remand him to the state correction facility. We do not have tribal detention facilities in Alaska. In Alaska, in addition, the State Commission will allow the Tribal Police Department to apply for their BIA Special Law Enforcement Commission. 
The Chukun officers have completed the training, but since Alaska is not considered Indian country, this is the route we have to go. Having the Federal Special Law Enforcement Commission allows the officers to send Title U.S. 18 cases to the U.S. Attorney's Office for major crimes. The Alaska Pilot Program has given Alaska people hope until February 15, 2024, when Alaska Representative George Rauscher introduced a bill, House Bill 326. Should this bill pass, Chukalum police will not be able to have a special commission with the state troopers. This is unconceivable that the Alaska legislature would provide a bill so uh, pointly against Alaska Native people already struggling with minimal, and in many cases, no law enforcement response for the communities. 40% of our state does not have law enforcement in their area. Sometimes it can take hours and days uh, for law enforcement to respond depending on the weather. The state of Alaska state troopers, they are short-staffed, about 60 state troopers in the state of Alaska. We want to develop a good working relationship with the local, state, and federal aid partners, especially since we share that concurrent jurisdiction with them. There are many multiple factors that are facilitating the Alaska pilot program. One is the desire concern for Alaska's high number of missing and murdered, especially with Alaska Native women. Two, substance misuse within the community. And three, sexual violence, abuse, just to name a few in the priority areas. Here are some statistics. Traffickers pay a thousand finder fee for kids to gather personal information on vulnerable peers to make contacts with their schools and report back to the traffickers. This has happened and reported in schools in Alaska. 42% of Alaska trafficking victims are Alaska Native women, mostly children. Alaska is one of the top states which human traffickers come from all over the world to get people and children because traffickers consider them pre-groomed because of the high amount of abuse, sexual abuse, depression, and suicide. Anchorage is third in the nation for missing and murdered. An overwhelming number of sexual offense cases reported in Alaska are not prosecuted. Barely 50% of were accepted for prosecution in 2018 and 2019. And I'll skip since I'm running out of time. For Alaska, we do not have casinos. We do not have gas stations. We depend every, every year for, for grants. We, don't, we need added uh, Alaska Native villages in the wording. We can't get special commission or funding through BIA because uh, we're not Indian country. Thank you. Thank you. Vivian Corthus, would you please unmute and give your comments? Good morning, can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Thank you, my name is Vivian Corthus. I serve as the Chief Executive Officer for the Association of Village Council Presidents. I'm calling in from Bethel, Alaska. AVCP is the largest tribal consortium in the nation with 56 federally recognized tribes as members. We serve 56 tribes located on the Yukon River, Kuskokwim River, in, in the Bering Sea coast in western Alaska. Attorney General Barr declared a public safety emergency in rural Alaska. Attorney General Barr declared a public safety emergency in rural Alaska. And we thank him for recognizing the issue. We also want to underscore that public safety in Alaska, the current public safety conditions in Alaska are not acceptable. I'm going to go directly to recommendations. First, I served as one of the members of the Not Invisible Act Commission. I have seen that Department of Interior, Department of Justice responses to the commission's report. I encourage Congress to do their part and address and fund all the recommendations and especially the recommendations specifically in Al for Alaska. I ask the committee to hold hearings on the Not Invisible Act findings. Second, I want to underscore that Alaska tribes need annual non-competitive base funding for public safety and justice. Right now in our region, we used to have three, now we have 10, and we're really lucky to go up to 10. Village public safety officers funded through a grant from the state to cover 48 villages and 56 tribes. That alone is not acceptable. We have to have public safety in every single one of our villages. Three, we recommend that Department of Justice work with Congress and create and fund a rural Alaska pilot project to address public safety. Or our villages are on the forefront of any security issue that happens in the, on the northern border here in Alaska. 
We are the eyes and the ears all, all along the coastline. This should be considered as part of public safety because our volunteer search and rescue village crews at the village level are all volunteer. We urge public safety to address search and rescue at the village level and fund them. Five, we support local training here in Alaska, rural Alaska. Six, and this is my closing. In closing, Alaska tribes deserve the same access to public safety as our com other communities on the road system here in Alaska and in the lower 48. We are not asking for anything less or anything more than any other community in the United States. Thank you. Thank you. Jeff, stiff arm, would you please raise your hand so Claudio can find you? Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Jeff Stiffarm. I'm the president from Fort Belknap in the Indian community up in Montana, home of the uh, Ani and the Dakota people. And I want to thank you for your time, for listening. And uh, I guess my first comment would be is um, I hope this is not uh, just a, uh, a listening session just to check, off, check a box. I hope what we're all saying, or not just myself, other tribal leaders, chief of police, what we're all talking to you about, you'll take home to your, um, to our leaders here in Congress, understand what we're saying, what our issues are back home. You know, I, I testified on an appropriations committee and in my testimony I said, you know, um, Congress sends billions and billions of dollars overseas for wars to kill people. What we're asking for more money is to save our people. And here we are. We are the first people of this country. Yet we're always overlooked. And one of my biggest issues here is, is the BIA and how they adequate their, their funding for law enforcement. I was a past chief of police for 20 years back home in Fort Belknap. We took over our law enforcement in 1997. Our secretarial amount that we were given back then was um, 1.2 million. Here we are in 2024. Our secretarial amount is 1.3 million. Increased 200,000 in 27 years. Now, you hear a lot of testimony from other people here, other leaders, that um, the lack of funding we can't compete with other departments with their higher wages. Fort Ballam is not any different than these other programs, these other reservations. We can't compete. Last year, I was told by Assistant Secretary Newland, tribal leaders meeting back home in Montana, they were giving their BIA officers raises. So I asked them, are you giving tribal law enforcement raises? No. I said, why not? No response. So my thing is to ask you to take back to your, your bosses is look at the BIA and how they allocate their money, whether it's to law enforcement, whether it's to courts, whether it's to social services, programs like that. How do they allocate their money? President Biden gave millions and millions of dollars to tribal law enforcement a year or two ago. You know what Fort Bonlap's cut was? 65000 how much did BIA keep in their pockets for their wages, their raises, their law enforcement? You know, and I know Mr. Addington. He used to be a director of interior for BIA. He knows. So was um, Elgin Young, chief of police, Pine Ridge. He worked in BIA many years. He knows the ad inadequacies between what BIA receives and how they allocate to the tribes and the disparity in the allocation of this money. I want you guys to look at how they distribute and allocate to the tribes, to the BIA. Fort Ballant had to sue. Pine Ridge sued. Northern Cheyenne and Montana is suing for the lack of funding for our public safety. 
we're going to increase ours. Or, um, or I, I don't want to say, but I guess our base money, the well, only way we're going to do it is because we had to sue the federal government. Well, with that, I want to thank you. And please listen to us. Don't just check the box and what we're saying here. We want you to actually listen to us. Thank you. Thanks so much. Roberta Murphy, if you're online, would you please unmute and give your comments? Hello? Yes, ma'am, we can hear you. Can you Go hear ahead. me? Okay, thank you. Hello, my name is Roberta Murphy. I am the tribal administrator for Chalunic Native Village, and I am also the regional council member for the Yukon Kuskokwim Regional Tribal Government, also known as RTG. Thank you for hosting this important listening session. The Yukon, the Yukon region, Yukon Kuskokwim region is a vast region, approximately the size of New York. About 33,000 people live in the region. Our region is considered an unorganized borough, meaning that there is no county level government. For the 65 years following the Alaska state, statehood, the Alaska, the state and federal government have consistently fallen short in safeguarding Alaska Native communities. This failure has violated the federal government's trust responsibility to Alaska Native people. Alaska is a PL 280 state, and in 1999, Alaska Native leaders sued the state, calling state calling the absence of police in remote communities unconstitutional. Unfortunately. The Alaska Supreme Court held in favor of the state, finding that the lack of certified village police officers could be explained by financial and geographical constraints rather than racial bias or purposeful neglect. While it is true that financial and geographic constraints have led to the severity of the public safety crisis in our region, we also face constraints on our ability to govern and provide protection through tribal jurisdiction. The regional tribal government in our region is something our elders have talked about forming for decades. The regional, the regional tribal government was developed with limited powers and with a vision to provide region-wide services that aren't being adequate, adequately provided by any tribal government. Alaska Native Corporation and the state or any nonprofit entity. Addressing the public safety crisis in our region is one of those gaps that the RTG seeks to address. But our circumstances are unique and not fully understood by the state or the federal government. In 2019, an investigation revealed that one in three communities in Alaska, about 70 altogether, have no law enforcement, no local law enforcement. Many of these unprotected communities are in Western Alaska. In response, to the, in response to that investigation, former Attorney General William Barr declared a law enforcing emergency in rural Alaska and announced $10.5 million in Justice Department spending to support the village police. Throughout a step, although it's a step in the right direction, that investment didn't provide the necessary improvement for public safety in our region. To understand the crisis we are facing, it is important to understand the Alaska Native Claim Settlement Act. One of the primary ways INCA is contributing to the public safety is through its impact on land ownership and use. By transferring land to corporation, INCA changed the, the traditional land use patterns and access rights. This, shifted dispute, this shift disputed local governance. Additionally, poor infrastructure Thank you for that. Michael LaRogue, would you please stand and raise your hand? Are you in the room, Michael? Okay. Catherine Edwards, if you're... Michael LaRock. Apologies, sir. Anin Bouju, Mike LaRock. I'm the uh, Secretary of Treasurer of the Wired Nation. I'm uh, also the retired, I'm a retired uh, director of public safety, chief of police for White Earth Nation also. So one of the things that I wanted to just talk about is uh, we're a public lot 280 tribe. 
So, and I, I, my career spans from BIA to tribal to public law uh, reservations. So I've seen what it looks like with a BIA agency. They give you the money and they tell you you have to, you have to be able to make it work with that dollars they give you, no matter what. So a lot of them fall very, very short. The tribe that I worked for in uh, Minnesota uh, was a small tribe that, got, that also got BIA funding, and that's what it was. If we're short, we're short. We had to deal with it. So otherwise, we had to supplement with the general fund from our, from our tribe. That's what I want to speak about today with the White Earth Nation is that we're a public law 280 tribe. We have agreements with uh, mutual aid agreements with all the county agencies, the state. Uh, we only get, we, we get, right now we get $272,000 from self-governance money. Our budget is 26 officers and we have, and our, and our budget is $3 million for our whole public safety. So that's, so we're a little bit, of, we're a little bit short. We do participate in the highway safety program also, which comes from the, from the national uh, traffic safety, uh, but that's for our highway safety officers. I want to speak a little bit about retention also. I've heard that in the room about the retention of officers. It's getting very, very hard to keep your tribal officers when you have state, state agencies that are paying not only double or even more than that for bonuses and things like that. So, But I, I just wanted to just express that a lot of the things that are being said by the other tribes here is not uncommon for every tribe across the nation. We're all having problems with our fentanyl. We're all having trouble with our opioid problem. We, uh, we, we're having problem with, uh, with our traffic. We're having trouble with everything that we need help with. I'll swing back over to the funding source again. We have our, our basically, our general fund funds most of, our, most of our police department. And that takes away crucial, crucial wraparound services from other other parts of our of our nation that could be using for you could be used for addiction for other things like that. So, but uh, I just want to close with saying I'd like to you know I'd like to thank the committee for letting us speak here today. I see you got 35 minutes. I think I'm going to use it again here. So everybody else is using their minutes. So, but I, I just I'd just like to say a thank you for letting me speak here today. So, miigwech. Thank you, Catherine Edwards. If you're on the WebEx, would you please proceed with your comments? Okay, let's move along. Nicholas Lewis, are you on the WebEx? Would you unmute and proceed yes. with your comments? Can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Nicholas Lewis, Council Member for the Lummi Nation in Washington State. Uh, I also serve as the Chairman of the Northwest Portland Area and Health Board, and I serve on three national organizations, uh, the National Indian Health Board, Tribal Self-Governance, and uh, NCAI and really want to uh, support what my fellow tribal leaders here have been uh, saying as well as our tribal representatives uh, at every conversation we have these are common themes and in a lot of the work that i've been doing uh, when we worked on creating and getting the national opiate uh, tribal summit uh, going and when we had those hearings that, that report was referenced a lot that took a lot of work and what we're still seeing here today is a lot of those same recommendations addressing the barriers are still being talked about. Many of our tribal leaders have shared uh, that we come and travel to DC and we advocate and where is the accountability um, to our ask, to our uh, advocacy? Um, there are a few things that I, I would like to, to ask the, this uh, committee here is you know, when we did that report that was referenced a lot, um, I'd like to see a report back from the committee on addressing every one of the recommendations. Um, I understand some things are not able to be done. Some are harder, uh, but there are things that can be done. Um, and even when they're, uh, we're told that they can't be done, there's a reason why. And so by you uh, and, and the, the staff, the committee uh, being able to be uh, able to share that level of communication and information, it'll help us identify better uh, what fixes we need to go and work on. Uh, as you're, you're seeing, tribal leaders are going to show up, tribes are going to show up because this is killing our people at the highest rates in the country. And so I'd like to see um, something from the committee explaining where we are with all of our recommendations that we have. 
Um, we have been asking our governor here in Washington state to declare a state of emergency as many of our tribes have. And our governor will say no, not until the uh, administration and the powers that be back in DC uh, declare one because our state runs at a deficit of funding. And so we've been advocating uh, for that, that we pass the resolution at NCAI. We put it, the, the languages in the report. Um, we've been having a lot of conversations around that, but we need a lot more support to push the administration to declare this. Um, when we talk about competing with the counties, tribes don't have the same ability to bring in revenue. Not all the tribes have casinos. We're at a disadvantage because of a lack of being able to tax. Uh, in our community, uh, one year, uh, $40 million of property was sold on our reservation because we're a checkerboard reservation. And we've been advocating to our county that you are collecting tax dollars off of the reservation and none of those revenue, those resources are coming back to support our, our community. Uh, we entered a 1092, so we have full jurisdiction over our reservation. But what that's doing is making our law enforcement officers enforce three sets of law, tribal, state, and federal. There's not any other federal or any other law enforcement agency that's enforcing multiple sets of laws, and we're doing that at a disadvantage. Um, our law enforcement is frustrated with that. Our community is frustrated because we're doing three times the work and not getting any financial support. Thank you for that. Frank Jamerson, if you're online, would you please unmute and proceed? Uh, good afternoon, committee. Uh, my name is Frank Jamerson. I represent the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe. I'm the vice chairman. You know, today we've been uh, echoing a lot of the same issues in Indian country. You hear these numbers that are being brought forward and they've been brought forward many times. And I'm gonna reflect back to the time of 2007 when I first came out here as a junior councilman and I met in front of Mr. Pat Ragsdale. Mr. Ragsdale sat and heard all of our complaints that we had, our issues. And until he actually put his pen down and he came to Standing Rock, did he realize how we were underfunded and all the lack of all resources coming to our tribe. So today we come again, 17 years later, here I stand before again with the issues that have plagued our Standing Rock Sioux tribe. And they kind of dominoed into a lot of the issues that we have that are creating more and more. So today the lack of law enforcement creates and promotes and ensures a safe haven for those criminals who are preying on our people back home. This ongoing domino effect created the lawlessness and ensures our people, they're at the mercy of those who are, who are uh, criminals who are engaged in such activities, excuse me. The drug crisis, violence, theft, leave our people in a state of mind of whether there will be another tomorrow the dismal outlook of life that has been created not only affects current generations, but generations to come. Standing Rock in 2007 had less than six officers on 2.3 million acres of land. In February 2024, our chief judge had sent a message to our chairwoman, El Kair. We had three officers who were patrolling Standing Rock. They were burnt out but they continued to protect our people. And due to the lack of trust and an ongoing broken promises, we can't enter into an agreement of memorandums of aids or agreements because we fully can't trust the system. We have other agencies who are willing to assist, but again, we can't get to the table because that relationship can't be created because of the lack of trust. On behalf of the members of the San Rock Sioux Tribe, I come here again to ask, can you guys please listen? And not only listen, but start acting on all of the tribes amongst us who are pleading the same and crying the same issues on our tribal homelands. So today, I just wanna say on, again, on behalf of the members of the San Rock Sioux Tribe, I'm gonna ask you guys not only just to listen, but try to put into effect what we're feeling back home. And I think about this, 
Our reservations are surrounded by state lands. So if we're having issues on reservations, everything around us, they're having the same issues. So again, I want to say thank you to the committee, the chairman of this committee, Schatz, Vice Chairman Murkowski, Senator Round, Senator Thune, and uh, Congressman Dusty Johnson. Their leadership back home in our two states, North Dakota and South Dakota, they're doing all they can to help us. But again, it's falling to deaf ears. And until we can all come together, we're going to have the same issues. So again, thank you. Thank you. Rick Peterson, would you please unmute and give your comments? Uh, good afternoon, committee members, staff, and my fellow tribal leaders. I'm Rick Peterson, the current vice chairman of the Red Cliff Band of Lake Superior up in northern Wisconsin. Uh, I'm here today to voice Red Cliff support for uh, the Senate Bill uh, 2695, part of which would allow tribal police officers under the 638 contract to be eligible for the federal law enforcement pension. The current ineligibility of tribal police officers to take part negatively impacts law enforcement's ability to effectively fight tribe and, uh, crime in tribal communities. Because officers are not eligible for the pension, recruitment and retention of experienced tribal officers is an ongoing problem and is a big issue in, in, com in combating uh, crime within the community. With this revolving door, our police department personnel is constantly overturning. Many surrounding municipalities actively recruit officers from tribal police departments because they know they can offer enrollment in either a state or federal pension program. The, death, the, the uh, federal pension also allows a very important, if not most important part of a uh, police officer's uh, benefits and that's the death and disability benefits. Tribal police officers are not afforded the same benefits as their peers to ensure that their families are taken care of should they be injured or worse, lose their life in the line of duty. Tragically, this has happened, and as a result of not being enrolled in law enforcement pension plan, their families were not provided the same resources as a state or federal officer who made the same sacrifice. Tribal police officers are performing the same duties as a federal BIA enforcement officer in the same capacity and are entitled to the same benefits. I'm here to ask all to support Senate Bill 2695 and allow our tribal police officers to be eligible for the equal benefits they, they deserve. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, we are at 4.30, but I know there are still a number of folks who uh, would like to provide comments, both online and in the room here. So folks are willing to continue, so are we. Uh, so let's go for another half hour. Ms. Shannon Hosley, if you're online, would you please unmute and give your comments? Yes, good afternoon. Um, Shannon Holsey, president of the Sackridge Muncie Band of Mohegan Indians. I also serve as the president of the Great Lakes Intertribal Council, which consists of 11 federally recognized tribes in Wisconsin, one in Michigan, and also I serve as the VAWA Task Force Co-Chair. Good afternoon and thank you for allowing me the opportunity to address you here today. I will not reiterate and duplicate some of the sentiments shared with you today by my fellow tribal leaders in Indian country but I would like to focus on a few core areas specifically as just um, reiterated by Vice Chairman Peterson with regards to Senate Bill 2695, the Parity for Tribal Law Enforcement Act, which we all know would bring a significant um, benefit to Indian country and our tribal nations as it relates to stabilization. And also just as it relates to, he had, uh, he had expounded on especially the important language that addresses the inequity related to retirement, disability, death, and survivor's benefits. 
Also, in recognition of the comparable role, the amendment would allow tribal officers to be deemed federal officers in a number of areas, including for the purpose access to civil service retirement benefits under subchapter 83 of Title V of the United States Code. A change in this federal law would also provide critical support for the continued viability of not only our law enforcement and our cross deputized officers, but all of Indian country. The reality of providing that effective law enforcement regiment for people living on and around our reservations and having state certified officers who are also cross trained and cross deputized has really um, provided a seamless and flexible move to a new job, which we are finding complexity in the training ground that it affords. It typically will take a year to fill jobs. And as you've heard throughout today, many of them um, are unable to compete with what's um, provided by both their county and state. But I also wanna shift to the opioid endemic, which is a national public health crisis impacting individual families and communities across the country. American Indians and Alaska Natives have been particularly, as expressed today, hit hard by this crisis that has just devastated so many of our communities. And the crisis has also strained these communities' law enforcement, healthcare, foster care, and other social services programs. The crisis is tremendous, a tremendous burden for many tribal communities, and stabilizing law enforcement will help improve the health and lives of our communities um, affected by this opioid endemic. I also want to reiterate in a system where legal recourse is already mismatched to the problem, an additional layer of complexity exists in Indian country through the strict dictates of various authorities that can enforce laws on tribal members and non-members. For major crimes, the federal government is responsible for investigation and prosecution, but in recent years, the U.S. Attorney's Office has declined to prosecute a, a relative steady rate of one-third of the cases referred, to in referred from Indian country. Criminal justice officials within local communities lack the resources and support to survive and necessary to prevent movements and impacts of drugs. Furthermore, complicated jurisdictional schemes make it difficult to penalize drug dealers, especially if they come from an outside reservation. Thus, illegal behavior can then persist in tribal areas due to jurisdictional constraints as expressed today, as well as financial and manpower constraints within the community police. The system of opioid demand can perpetuate itself while benefiting from illegal impunity. Tribal governments need resources to provide law, basic law enforcement, prosecutorial, and judicial services to maximize safety for our relatives who are victimized by domestic violence and sexual assault and hold offenders accountable. Thank you so much for those comments. J. Michael Chavarria, would you please proceed with your comments? All right, well, Omiyaga uh, Neos TVT, again, out of respect and uh, good afternoon. My name is Michael Chavarria serving as governor for Santa Clara Pueblo here in New Mexico. I'd like to give uh, thanks to chairman, vice chairman, members of the committee uh, and the staff. And unfortunately, substance abuse and alcohol still plagues us. Incarceration is not the answer. We need secure treatment facilities that provide culturally sensitive behavioral health, new diagnosis, treatment and counseling programs. Unfortunately, such facilities no longer exist or non-existent in our area here in New Mexico. Enforcement of laws and appropriate treatment for offenders is crucial. Alternative sentencing besides incarceration can be a viable option. However, we can't do this alone. We need your help with appropriate financial uh, appropriations and funding. As we all heard, police departments in the country are understaffed, underfunded. Violence in the country is higher. Police departments in the country have a hard time retaining uh, police officers. You know, added funding will allow us to expand our dispatch center, will bring us in compliance with BIA standards. Additional funding could increase our funding for cost of living, salary, to be competitive. Uh, unfortunately for us here in Santa Clara, we're only eight, eight miles away from Los Alamos National Laboratory, where they offer $50 an hour for a security officer, compared to us at only $25 an hour. So that's not competitive. But again, it's not just for law enforcement, tribal courts. It also has to include our behavioral health program and, and social services as well. You know, the tribal funds we are utilized to support our self-governance program. We are our self-governance program. Uh, the BIA funding to self-governance is based on tribal share. 
and that data is inadequate, it does not allow us to fully 100% support that federal authority and that federal function that makes it difficult. So my request to Congress is to let's get away from a formula-based funding and transition to a needs-based funding, allowing us to determine how best to meet our public safety needs. I know three minutes is not enough time to fully address and elaborate on many of our public safety needs here in Santa Clara. So we will do our written comments to be submitted to the record, uh, which is very important. For us in Santa Clara, we got to send our, our men to Virginia for substance abuse um, treatment and into Wake County in North Carolina for the women. And so that's far away from New Mexico, but it does cost uh, the Pueblo to go ahead and get this type of treatments to our people. So I appreciate the time, uh, Chairman, Vice Chair, members of the committee. Thank you for that. Mark Macaro, would you please unmute and give your comments? All right. Am I live? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Macaro. I'm the uh, current NCAI president, and I'm also the tribal chairman for the Pechanga Band of, um, of Lucena Indians in Southern California. Um, where to start? There's just so much here. Uh, and, and I really it, I've, I've appreciated so much of the testimony that tribal leadership has brought forward. Indian country is in acute crisis right now um, and has been for for decades, actually. Uh, crisis in law enforcement, crisis in public safety, crisis in justice. Uh, now, the solution, one of the fundamental solutions is the restoration of our own sovereign governments to protect our citizens in their own homes and on our lands. And, and, and this means it, that Congress needs to pass a legislative fix to the su Supreme Court's holding in Oliphant. Uh, until that happens, our public safety crisis will unfortunately continue. No amount of data, police officer training, detention centers, on and on, can ever address the gap in tribal jurisdiction that prevents us from protecting our own. And without robust next level, next level congressional appropriations, um, it's not, it, it won't happen. They need to happen together. Uh, restore Oliphant and, uh, and, 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 and create new funding levels, robust funding levels to get the job done. Uh, and so uh, Indian country would welcome that. Uh, we, we need to stop tinkering around the margins with, you know, a little bit of funding here, a little, you know, preserve the status quo there. Uh, and all that is welcome, certainly, but it to get to the next level and, and do what needs to be done. Uh, that's what that's what we need to, to focus on. And every session of Congress uh, needs to have an Oliphant bill in it um, so that uh, until it gets passed, we need to stay focused on that. Now, there's 56 million acres in Indian country, uh, and in any given time, as you've heard, there are a handful of, of officers uh, in, in patrol, and um, every call for service, MMIP, MMIW, uh, other series of crimes, fentanyl crimes, dealers, uh, cartels, every call for service um, is has an extended response time. It's, it's unacceptable. Uh, Every, every non-Indian community in the United States wouldn't accept what's happening in any country, and something needs to be done about that. Uh, we heard from Oglala Sioux Tribe uh, with their pop, tribal population. You know, there's a federal standard of 2.4 .4 officers per thousand people in the population. Given uh, Oglala's uh, population, they would have, I think my math was 123.5 officers, to, just to use that federal number. Uh, so they're way off. I think he said they have 30. So uh, there's more to be said here. We'll submit these comments in writing, but uh, there are some fixes to Public Law 280 that, that need to happen um, and we're concerned about as a result of the Castro Huerta bill. And so uh, we'll be discussing that. The last thing I'm going to say, because I, I know I'm just about out of time, is um, in my State of Indian Nation speech in, in, in February, uh, I, I put a call out, kind of put a gauntlet out there that uh, we need to have a tribal summit to talk about the big picture solution to uh, 
this law enforcement, public safety and justice uh, uh, crisis that we're in. And uh, it involves many pieces, but uh, fundamentally, uh, the top two are Oliphant and uh, robust funding. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate the leadership of the committee and that the staff is digging into this, uh, th- these subjects. It's absolutely critical to Indian country. Thank you. Thank you. T.O. Smith, would you please unmute and give your comments? Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, really appreciate the opportunity on behalf of ROCAP, uh, but also I'll identify um, the leadership of the committee. Thank you for listening and having this session today. I will not be redundant. Uh, I'm hopeful to the comments given prior. We uh, also appreciate um, Chair Schatz and especially Vice Chair Murkowski met with her office recently as well. I'm going to submit a more detailed um, uh, submittal, but today I'll highlight a, a couple of things for the committee. Um, number one, I'm I'm an Anxia Corporation shareholder. I'm a tribal member. I worked for the um, a number of regional corporations, and now I'm working for the statewide uh, community action agency called Rural Cap. It's been around for 60 years. It has a, a, a nonprofit footprint of the state of Alaska, and also it has a for-profit subsidiary that uh, contributes to the energy uh, solutions uh, for heating at homes in Alaska and also pays a dividend back to the Community Action Agency to promote its its uh, strategic uh, mission. I'll highlight today a couple of things more particular on public safety. Um, we operate uh, uh, Alaska Tribal Justice Resource Center and Tribal Justice Training and Technical Assistance Services. And um, the center provides training and technical assistance to Alaska tribes funded by DOJ, coordinated tribal assistance, solicitation grants, and unfunded tribes seeking to develop and enhance their respective tribal courts and justice systems. I want to highlight before I go on to just three particular uh, priorities for for the testimony is that we're not here to talk on behalf of any um, corporation or tribal entity. Um, more importantly, Rural Cap has shown up in the past as a convener and a, and a leadership strategic partner for 60 years, and we want to continue to do so for the next 60 years. More recently, we have helped um, with the Navigator program to help tribes report back to Treasury, I think uh, just under 100 recently. So we're going to continue to be a back office, if you will, uh, to those that need and uh, want to do so in a cost-effective and strategic manner. The three things I have for you today are asks are uh, for continued support and funding to provide Alaska uh, and Native organizations the resources they need to continue their public safety and infrastructure development services. Um, the funding would allow for employ, employ and increase the number of officers, uh, develop capacity of departments, establish a portable Alaskan-based academy, and formulate cross-jurisdictional cooperative agreements, including cross-deputization of tribal, state, and federal law enforcement officers. And uh, number two, uh, support and strengthen collaboration between Alaska-based statewide and regional training and technical assistance providers and administrators. We we realize that um, it's important that there are um, unique perspectives and custom solutions, um, as uh, Vice Chair Murkowski stated. And so we want to continue to show up that way on behalf of all those that contribute. Last but not least, um, provide uh, support for our Native communities to access the federal infrastructure opportunities available. Our communities do not have postal addresses recognized by federal grant tools. The broadband needed for access and submission the staffing required to make opportunities come alive for um, sustainable future. What our communities do have is a clear understanding of their strengths, hopes, and a vision for the futures. They need access uh, to the improved tools that the rest of the country has and that this committee can help us to get. Thank you very much for the opportunity today. Thanks so much. Jacob Harlan, would you unmute the WebEx and give your comments, please? 
Hello, uh, my name is Jacob Harlan. I'm an enrolled member of the Omaha Tribe of Nebraska. Um, I'm speaking on behalf, I feel, of the people that don't feel they have a voice in my tribe. You know, for the past couple of years, my sister and I and some other community members, um, I know every tribe is different, but our tribe, it seems like our leadership and tribal council are part of, or majority of the reason why we have as much issues as we do internally. Um, you know, with the self-sovereignty, self-determination, it, it seems like there's an unfair kind of biased way that our tribal court and justice system is being applied. You know, there was even a recent walkout of all the tribal officers because of uh, kind of like an ultimatum the tribal chief had given one of the officers. So in solidarity, they walked off together. It, it seems like the, you know, a lot of these issues have been talked about already, the epidemic of drugs and people that, you know, come to our reservation. It's a smaller reservation in Nebraska, knowing that they can operate pretty much, you know, without having to worry about any kind of, you know, tribal law enforcement interfering. It, it, it seems like, you know, I, I've tried to reach out to our area director, our, you know, the person in charge for our uh, Bureau of Justice, of EIA Justice Services. I don't give a response. I reach out to the tribal justice um, person in D.C., and I never get any kind of responses. I don't know where, you know, we can seek help. I mean, you know, they're blatantly violating our tribal constitution and codes, and it seems like it's it's almost hopeless. You know, our, our elections are interfered with. You know, I've been establishing relationships with FBI, and they had let me know that unless something is um, kind of originates from our tribal council, that there's no possibility for them to intervene. It's very frustrating. I feel like this allows almost this lawless feeling and people that are victims are, are pretty much uh, re-victimized if they're forced to have to go to file a report knowing that most likely the cases are going to be dismissed. It's given this bleak outlook for our tribe and you know, we've done what we could and it seems like even our elections are interfered with. You know, the lack of funding, you know, the turnover of you know, law enforcement officers. It's just very heartbreaking. You know, it, it, it hurts my heart to see and hear all these stories of things that shouldn't be happening. And, you know, and not knowing what else I can do at this point, because I feel like I've exhausted every option. And, and that's what keeps me going, is I'm knowing that there's children in this world that don't deserve to be treated the way they are. And the things that they have to endure, that, that it isn't right. And I'm, I'm, I'm pleading and I'm asking people that what can we do at this point where, where can we go for help when we can't even help ourselves i feel like at this point you know assistance outside is needed it's like we're living under a dictatorship and it's it's only gotten worse you know with the increase in drug use and just my i saw this on my link page and i was like man this is maybe an opportunity i can get our message across to somebody to hopefully get a response because we're hurting in our reservation and we really don't have an opportunity to reach out beyond it, it always comes back well your tribal council your tribal council and yet these are the ones that are responsible for doing this the funding they receive it doesn't get to our members it's used as you know almost like a personal piggy bank and the rest of us are struggling for contractors come in knowing they can embezzle and they can take you know advantage of people that don't know any better it, it, it's sad and it's just difficult to have to bear and to hear thank you for those comments chief rodriguez would you please unmute and proceed no worries let's move along melissa eagle bear would you please unmute Proceed on the WebEx. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Hi, good evening or good afternoon. My name is Melissa Eagle Bear. I'm from Rosewood Sioux Tribe Adult Correctional Facility in South Dakota. Um, thank you for giving me three minutes of your time. Um, I just wanted to start out by saying. Uh, I'm going to speak on behalf of, of Indian Country Jails uh, because that's where I'm working. Uh, but our tribal nations are deteriorating at a high rate 
right, directly related to law enforcement, the crisis that we're dealing with. We are in a critical state and it's the federal government's responsibility to protect Indian country, right? To protect our children, to protect our elders. I welcome all of you to come, come live out here, come see us, live here on our reservation for one month, right? And, and with what funding you're providing us, you give the tribe, give us your resolve to the issues that plague our lands. The federal government is failing, and I will say it again, they're failing by not addressing the crisis in Indian country. Um, we have inadequate funding. I will say it if I have to say it a hundred times. In our, our correctional facility, I have had over 180 inmates in custody, the largest amount in, in, our, in South Dakota, with barely enough money to provide staffing, let alone food, blankets, cleaning products, right? Gas for vehicles. We are given pennies, but we were required to figure it out, right? We're required to make it work. Um, one of BIA's terminology, they've told me over years, I've been in this field for almost 15 years and I've heard it over and over, best practices, right? Our funding is based on some magic formula that I could never figure out rather than what is actually needed in a field. What is it going to take more deaths or complete loss of language because I see it all around. We're losing our language, we're losing our identity. What is it gonna take before the government, the federal government takes action and prioritizes? Uh, we also have a health, uh, crisis uh, of healthcare and correctional facilities. Unfortunately, Indian country jails are not even considered when it comes to healthcare for inmates. Rosebud has to, to rely on our local Indian health care, which they send everybody out. So my staff are having to drive 250 miles for medical care with inmates. And, and I'm sure you guys are all, all aware uh, of the, the violent crimes that, that these inmates are committing. So if you can imagine having these officers on a road across the state with inmates. Almost every day we're on, on the road because we don't have health care. Recruitment and retention is another issue. I have a high turnover. It's across Indian country. Indian country jails have a high turnover. And when we get past that one year background, right? It does. It takes a year to get someone cleared for a background. We're required to send our officers to the Indian Police Academy. And instead of adequately preparing my correction officers to deal with mental health crisis, to deal with the opioid crisis, or how to address uh, the meth inmates, the Indian Police Academy are teaching them how to shine their boots and iron their shirts. So they're sending my staff back unprepared, unprepared. And the other issue with retention and recruitment is we can't keep, we cannot keep uh, compete with the federal government. We don't have benefits. We, we definitely can't pay at the rate the federal government's paying. So once they get certified, we lose them. They be Thank you for that. I really appreciate the comments. Alfred Urbina, would you please unmute and provide your comments? Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity. My name is Fred Urbina. I'm the Attorney General for the Bosco Yaki Tribe in Arizona. To help tribes address public safety, please, re please restore additional tribal jurisdiction by increasing the number of VAWA covered crimes to include weapons and drug offenses by non Indian offenders. Congress should also develop legislation to create and fund regional tribal crime labs to help process evidence in these cases and violent crime cases. Congress should also increase the felony sentencing range cap 
or Toloa compliant tribes to 10 years. Violent crimes and sex crime offenses and also bolster the Toloa Bureau of Prisons Jail option to include re-entry and drug treatment services. The next VAWA or Toloa reauthorization should include a full jurisdiction pilot, an Oliphant fix. Congress should also increase the number of FBI agents, U.S. attorneys, and federal judges to address Indian country crime, specifically in places like Arizona and other border states where federal resources and dockets are tied up with immigration cases. Congress should make BIA Tawahi funding permanent and increase Tawahi funding opportunities for tribes to develop and model new justice and culturally appropriate public safety alternatives. Direct funding to tribal 638 contracts and self-governance compacts for law enforcement and tribal courts should be increased. Tribal victim services should be directly funded as part of annual increases to 638 contracts and not by cyclical DOJ grants. Congress should help strengthen the ability to enforce tribal court orders off reservation by amending uniform justice laws that deal with extradition, probation, and law enforcement parity. This is necessary specifically to manage VAWA non-Indian offenders, uh, enforce tribal warrants, and ensure that absconders who reside off reservation can be monitored. Finally, increase and directly fund tribal courts for mental health assessments, mental health courts, detox facilities, drug and al alcohol treatment alternatives, judges, court staff, and restoration and civil commitment programs. Please consider funding tribal pretrial services programs that will limit pretrial detention, protect victims, increase drug testing, and electronic monitoring while offenders are released pretrial. BI direct service detention alternatives should include substantial funding for reentry services and drug and alcohol treatment, uh, both post jail and in prison. Um, you can also provide funding for contracted services for tribes to utilize test, one, two, three, if they four, are five, contracting five, four, three, two, one, test. Thank you, Chairman Schatz and Ranking Member Murkowski, members of the committee and staff for the work you do for Indian Thank you. Apologies for the interruption. Cecil Sanford, would you please unmute and proceed on the WebEx? Hi, good afternoon. My name is Cecil Sanford. Um, I am a citizen of the Matassa Lake tribe. I work for Copper River Native Association as the village public safety officer coordinator in the Copper River area. Um, first of all, I would just like to echo what everyone else here is saying that we are all suffering from the lack of resources in, uh, to our tribes. As a public law 280 state and having ANSCA, we in Alaska have limited federal resources from the BIA in law enforcement and other federal resources due to the act that not all tribes in Alaska agree to, which is the act of AIDSCA. This act gave our tribes in my region a hardship due to the fact that we are not Indian country, which limited our funds from the federal government to help our people. Um, the state of Alaska, through a grant, provides VPSOs in my region, but the VPSOs do have limited jurisdiction, which do not honor our tribal laws um, if they are not concurrent with Alaska state law. I would just like to um, ask that this committee, committee looks into uh, the public law 280 language and into the Indian country language um, or Alaska uh, tribes in my region. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Lisa Coop Gunn, would you please stand arms and give your comments? Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for having this hearing. It's nice to see some familiar faces. Lisa Coop Gunn, um, on behalf of the Tulalip Tribes of Washington, I am an attorney and a federal advocate for the tribes. Um, just four issues I want to discuss 
uh, very quickly. Um, the first one, Senate Bill 2695, you've heard a lot about that today. I know you know what it is, recruitment, retention issues. It's a huge uh, issue for Talela Balso. We testified in November of 2023 over on the House side on that bill. Um, we've lost over 50% uh, 50 of our tribal officer workforce. We have replaced, it's been a revolving door. It takes us approximately a year to train them and then they get recruited outside because of the benefits. Um, that bill, time is of the essence. In the bill, the secretary has 24 months to develop procedures and um, credentialing um, procedures and guidance in order for tribes to implement that program. So if we're looking at timing right now, we're looking at at least a minimum three years to get that going. So I know the committee is interested in that bill. It is important though that it moves quickly because of that two year time frame. Um, another issue I would like to discuss, it has been discussed here, is um, full oliphant fix. Of course we want that, yes, but for the Tulalip tribes right now, we need to stop the bleeding. We've lost 63 tribal members in recent years. We need an expansion to be able to prosecute non-Indians over fentanyl and drug-related crimes. We've had 544 arrests of non-tribal members um, in the last three or four years. I was talking to a prosecutor today, 12 have been prosecuted by the feds. We're not sure about the state, but a lot are not being prosecuted. But again, tribes are best to police their own communities and prosecute those cases. Related to that, guns. Out of those 544 arrests, 201 guns were seized. Guns are used to protect the drug, to move the drunk, to collect debt. It happens in Indian country, it happens on the outside. That will be a collateral crime that we will see at least 50% of the time. If we get jurisdiction for the, for the fentanyl, we need the guns. Otherwise, those crimes will also go unprosecuted. Um, related to those investigations, the Stored Communications Act currently does not, does not recognize tribal courts for the purposes of disclosure of information for social media platforms and private messaging platforms. Um, we need to be able to get that. We, we issue subpoenas to Facebook, um, other social media companies, sometimes they respond, most of the times they don't. And if you look at the Story Communications Act, tribal courts are not recognized in there and that is why. So we need a fix for that if we're going to be able to investigate these cases. We investigate them now on the non-Indians, yet we're limited in what we can do. Um, the last one, oh, okay, thank you. Thank you. James Hosher, if you're on the WebEx, would you unmute and proceed with your comments? I am. Thank you. Uh, my name is James Hosher. I'm the director of the Village Public Safety Officer Division for the Department of Public Safety, State of Alaska. I'm also Yupik from the native of village of Hooper Bay, a community of which I served as a chief of police and a village public safety officer in the past. The Village Public Safety Officer Division began as a conceptual program in 1979 to address Alaska and rural public safety. <clears throat> the EPSOs provide public safety services in rural Alaska by decreasing the response time to emergencies and providing an ongoing proactive public safety presence in rural Alaska. Um, VPSO programs are locally managed by regional organizations which participate. Each program recruits, hires, and manages their VPSOs. And the priorities of the program, the state's role is to support each program to the best of its ability. VPSOs serve as a bridge between indigenous communities and the larger department, helping each other better understand and know the other, minimizing tension, tensions from police services, improving relationships, and developing needed trust and respect. As we endeavor to enhance the, and expand the VPSO program, it's important to acknowledge that the limitations of relying solely on state funding to serve all communities across Alaska's vast and challenging terrain. Federal assistance in funding, training, and infrastructure is vital to bolstering public safety and efforts in rural villages scattered throughout this expansive and culturally diverse state. The central question remains, how can we better coordinate with agencies responsible for public safety? In Alaska, both state and tribal jurisdictions coexist, while federal support for tribal justice programs can enhance public safety efforts by increasing capacity, 
For too long, the separate solutions have been developed independently to address the same issues, hindering progress towards shared goals of creating safer communities. In rural Alaska, where federal operation support positions are lacking, village and tribal police heavily rely on DPS for guidance and assistance. Improved coordination would enhance services provided by village police officers, tribal police officers, state troopers, and village public safety officers to the communities. Achieving effective public safety presence in all villages, combating accidents and crime requires a collaborative effort in involving state and federal and tribal authorities. Villages are best served when this collaboration happens. While I'm disheartened to hear about the impacts and the struggles that each one of the tribes and um, the leaders have brought forward, I am also encouraged by the committee having this listening session and the leaders providing their feedback and improving and fixing these problems that we all face and we struggle to endeavor to get our tribal members the public safety that they deserve. I thank you for listening to me um, and I appreciate everybody's uh, input as previously provided. Thank you so much. Chief Rodriguez, would you unmute to proceed with your comments, please? Yes, sir. Can you hear me? I can, sir. I can. Okay. Uh, thank you for allowing me to testify, especially for a committee that's dedicated to address Indian affairs and where our own senator, Senator Ben Ray Lujan, is a member of. My name is Victor Rodriguez, and I have, I'm the chief of police for the Pueblo of Isleta uh, Police Department. Uh, which stretches throughout several counties, including the largest county in the state of New Mexico, which is Albuquerque. And we are in between uh, the growing neighboring counties of Valencia. We have 5,000 enrolled members. We are swore, we have 46 sworn positions, 30 of eight, eight of them that are full, including our own dispatch center. And tribal leadership has been uh, committed to protecting its tribal members and its visitors. Cross-commissioning issues, just like other jurisdictions, uh, concern us, especially when we don't have criminal jurisdiction over non-Indians unless we have interagency commissioning agreements with our county sheriff or the state department of public safety, which can change at a moment's notice, especially for the county sheriffs who are elected officials. We are fortunate right now that we do have a good rapport with both of our uh, county sheriffs uh, where the heart of our uh, Pueblo population is located in. We do uh, advocate for federal legislation to give tribal law enforcement jurisdiction over non-Indian crime. It does not make sense that there's a stubble standard or unequal access. An example in New Mexico, off, uh, if, an, if a tribal member leaves the Pueblo, he is subject to state crime with no issues, but yet a non-Indian can come onto the Pueblo and they have to have special commissioning for us to be able to deal with them. Uh, as far as recruitment and retention, more federal funding for more law enforcement officers uh, and support staff. Yes, we receive 638 funding like other uh, of our tribal communities, but that is just a drop in the bucket, especially when higher wages and benefits cost more to remain competitive. Um, we have to compete with these metro agencies. Uh, the retirement benefits is a huge concern, and we would advocate for something that tied into federal officer system to uh, offer those. Uh, many tribal communities, as mentioned by the vice chair, uh, have been infested with non-Indian criminal activity. They use tribal lands as uh, their home base for their illicit criminal organization or be, uh, businesses. Luckily, the Pueblo here has taken it upon themselves to uh, publicly fund our narcotics unit to combat this gun crime, uh, but there should be more funding to be able to expand that. More equipment and technology is needed so we can address with a lot of these issues to include communications infrastructures where we can communicate with a lot of our uh, neighboring communities. Cut the red tape, too many obstacles and restrictions to use federal funding, especially when making budget modifications. Let's use that money where it's needed and have those grant staffers uh, help tribal communities best utilize that money opposed to them being a barrier. Uh, more tribal prosecution resources. We use two tribal prosecutors here to prosecute a lot of our resources in state court, which has been very beneficial for us, uh, but that shouldn't be the case. The, the tribe shouldn't have to f uh, fund these uh, these initiatives, uh, like most of the other tribal entities have uh, stated, uh, would, would likely go unprosecuted. 
And the last thing that I will talk about is uh, more funding for MMIP uh, jurisdiction. Let's create task forces to address these issues, not just advisory councils, especially in areas where we have dr dr task forces for drugs, auto theft, and terrorism, but we don't have task forces to overcome these jurisdictional issues and these funding issues when we need to look for loved ones and detention facilities, especially in juvenile crime, where we have seen quite an increase, especially in violent crime. Thank you for your time and in allowing me to speak. Thank you. Tammy Truitt Giroux, would you please unmute and proceed with your comments? Hello, thank you. My name is Tammy Truitt Giroux and I'm the Executive Director for the Alaska Native Women's Resource Center and I'm also an enrolled member to the ANVIC tribe. I am here today to talk about many of the things that are already have been expressed and so because of that I'll go ahead and put my comments directly to the intersectionality of homelessness and domestic violence on Alaska Native women and children. I think that there's oftentimes many people believe that homelessness and domestic violence are not connected or that there's no relationship between our Alaska Native women and who those that are experiencing homelessness. And it's important that we understand that homelessness is actually one of the main reasons that many people return to relationships that are very dangerous to them because of the fact that they have no place to go. I think it's important that we also talk about a report that Alaska Homeless Management Information System just put out and they found that there was 19,000 people who self-reported homelessness throughout the state and that 43.7% of those represented were American Indian or Alaska Native. Of the 19,000, there were 47% were women or girls and 23% of those women and girls reported a history of domestic violence that may or may not have contributed to their current homeless living situation. And additionally, that report found that 19.8% of all reported persons are reported are reporting chronic homelessness. Um, we can't ignore the intersectionality between domestic violence and homelessness and the studies that show 57% of all homeless women reported domestic violence as an immediate cause of their homelessness. Some of these circumstances could include fleeing a domestic violence situation with no alternative housing to go or landlords who evict victims from housing due to repeated calls to the police or property damage that is happening in by the abuser. So in our work with AKR as AK and WRC, our tribal safe housing program is really an important aspect to a lot of the other issues that we're talking about. The PL 280 re, uh, restrictions, the law enforcement issues, the, the housing issues, we have all of those things. And I think people have said there's a crisis in Indian country in Alaska Native villages, and we just need to emphasize that. Um, I just briefly, our recommendations are that uh, tribe must have access to sustainable, non-competitive funding to support their tribal justice systems, tribal police and services to support Alaska Native American Indian families, need the opportunity to develop infrastructure that supports transitional housing and tribally centered domestic violence shelters and services to ensure survivors are not becoming homeless. Um, many other recommendations, we'll go ahead and send in a, a written recommendation. I thank the um, committee, uh, committee for having this hearing and allowing us to speak. Thank you so much. Thank you. Christine Benali, would you please unmute and give your comments? Okay, Brenda Stanfield, if you're on the WebEx, would you please unmute and provide your comments? Yes, uh, thank you. I'm Brenda Stanfield. I'm the Executive Director of the Alaska Network on Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault. Uh, we're one of the federally recognized state coalitions here in Alaska. We have a membership of 24 domestic violence and sexual assault victim service providers across the state. And several of our network members are located in Alaska Native communities and all of our network members serve Alaska Native victims and survivors. I'm speaking to you today from the ancestral lands of the Tlingit people in Southeast Alaska, specifically from Juneau, home of the Akwan, who have been stewards of this land since time immemorial. Quite frequently, victim services may be seen as ancillary to public safety with attention focused on law enforcement. While law enforcement is a necessary component of public safety, so too, if not more so, are victim services. 
Law enforcement intervention is temporary, sometimes a first step to ending violence perpetrated in the home, and victim services are long-term, providing sanctuary and assistance to those seeking safety and relief from the abuse. From crisis calls to shelter to protective orders to support groups, victim services are available 24-7, 365 days of the year. Our Western Alaska providers, the Neelick Family Crisis Center, Bering Sea Women's Group, Emonic Women's Shelter, Bay Haven, Tundra Women's Coalition, and Safe and Fear-Free Environments are staffed with bilingual Yupik English speakers, with most staff serving in their home communities. Each agency provides culturally specific activities to assist those yes. healing and moving forward. Whether subsistence, fishing for shelter, berry picking, taking esteem, whichever practices. Unfortunately, these services are few and far between and our regional programs serve local communities and surrounding villages in areas the size of several states in the lower 48. Many villages do not have health aides. Some villages have village public safety officers or village police officers, but few have advocates or safe homes to help those who need immediate safety. Our member programs are a lifeline. Um, we would like to highlight work being done through our sexual response efforts. One of our members, Tundra Women's Coalition in Bethel, Alaska, serves Bethel and the 56 surrounding villages of the Yukon Kuskokwim Delta. And um, they are getting their sub-regional hub communities, Imana, Cooper Bay, Eniac, hopefully St. Mary's and Tukaset Bay in the near future. So victims will be able to access forensic examinations closer to their home villages. We believe this will help survivors of sexual assault report and access services more frequently. And we believe long-term that this is part of the answer to village public safety. When people in the village communities are in charge of the response, they will have more wisdom on how to effectively prevent violence in the future. Uh, we will turn in our written comments and we thank you so much for the time you have um, allowed to share our work being done here for victims and survivors in Alaska. We want to, we appreciate the benefits of partnership and the vital role that victim services play in the public safety system. So thank you very much. Christine Benali, would you please unmute and proceed? surrounding villages in areas the size of several states in the lower 48. Many villages do not have health aid. Yes, Some villages she have village public safety involved. officers or village police officers, but few have advocates or safe homes to help those who need immediate safety. Our member programs are a lifeline. Oh. Um, That's Christine. That's it, JR. Thank you so much. Uh, we are now just past uh, 5.15. Uh, thank you everyone for participating today, both uh, for those in the hearing room as well as online and on the phone. Uh, we very much appreciate your participation. Uh, we've learned a lot today, I think, speaking for staff. We've got our homework to do. Uh, thank you for all the input um, and the wonderful insight. Uh, appreciate your time and energy. Um, we may follow up directly with additional questions, so thank you for providing your contact information. And as a reminder, we'll be accepting written comments until April 12th at testimony at indian.senate.gov. That's testimony at indian.senate.gov. Thank you and good evening.